Well, hello, everyone. I am that Weems guy here for yet another episode. And returning today will be Mr. John Hearn. And John is out to a clear lead. Uh, this is his fourth appearance. So, uh, Bulky, go ahead and get ready. Gale House is like way behind the pack now. So, we've had our first mention, to, mention of Gale House for the show. And speaking of Gale House, he wants our audience to know that the uh, Modern Technique book by Mr. Morrison that Changosa mentioned several episodes ago is available through the Gunsight gift shop so or pro shop. So make sure you call Gunsight and order that book so that Eric can be kept in the lifestyle which he's become accustomed to being kept. And like I said, today, Mr. John Hearn is joining us again. And John is here to tell you why you're all wrong about everything. John, say hello and tell everybody who you are. Hey, John Hearn here. Um, kind of have a varied career path. I've been a law enforcement officer since 1992. Uh, teach a bunch of firearms, tactics, legal use of force for my agency. I've also been involved in private sector training since the late 90s. Uh, started teaching with Tom Givens of Rangemaster. I think it was 2001. So that sounds a lot like 20 years uh, also a notorious researcher and presenter. I've been researching, doing presentations since about 2005. Uh, hit all, a lot of the big conferences from the Range Master TACCON to ILFE. Um, and I'm just nerd out about this kind of stuff and, you know, gather information of use to a very small number of people. All right. Well, we're going to start today's conversation uh, by discussing the famous Range Master Casino drill. And, um, you know, we've all seen that, uh, the Range Master crowd has all seen that drill shot a lot. And so we know what a typical performance is by many of the people who frequent Range Master classes. And at the reunion this past year, Tom varied that up and had us vary our magazine round count so that the reloads would not come in the same place. And that impacted some people's performance. And of course, John, being the nerd that he is, uh, has quantified that. So, John, why don't you go ahead and jump in there? So uh, that was not my best class. Uh, I, I have to freely admit here in the presence of the Internet and everybody that Lee Weems did best me in three of the five score tests during this course. But fortunately, one of the, the, the scores I slightly eked out Lee on was the casino drill. And uh, real quickly, for those who don't know, I know we've got a lot of range master folks. So basically, you've got... Uh, six targets of various geometric shapes. They've each got a number and you have to shoot the one target tw once, two target twice, and so forth and so on. And typically the magazines are loaded seven, seven, and seven. And you can learn the pattern of the dots, know when to reload. And I think the the, the record on that is in the 10 seconds, like about 1033. So that's yeah. the, the fastest ever been shot. And um, I've been fortunate. I had a class high performance when we were out in Oklahoma uh, because uh, to be fair, uh, our friend, Mr. Clark, misloaded his magazines. Uh, he should have taken that. And his meltdown actually transferred to Carl Wren, who should have beaten me, and Spencer Keepers, who by all rights should have beaten me. So I was lucky enough to eke out that. And I think my best time on a, a classic casino was 1310 in that, uh, in that particular class. And I, I have a coin to that effect. Um, so that's the casino drill in a nutshell. Well, one of the things we find is that you can, if you just do the same thing over and over again, the reloads always happen at the same spot, you can get really good at that one particular skill. The problem is, is that just by doing something as simple as randomizing the reloads, right? The gun does not run empty at the exact time. You have to, um, you know, uh, reload the pistol kind of on the fly, for lack of a better words. Uh, so um, he was actually ashamed of his time at the class, so I won't share his name, but I was able to talk to the number one guy and my, myself. And we basically had a 15% penalty in our runs by simply doing nothing but changing when the reloads were happening, because we could not exactly predict when the reloads were happening, there was a 15% performance penalty. And if you think about it, you know, uh, high level USPSA shooters, matches are won by tiny percentages, right? So if you think about it, 15% um, performance hit from, you know, two reasonable shooters, you know, well, one really good shooter and me um, is a pretty significant change in performance. And it's one of those things that a lot of people kind of skipped over, but I think that it's a, a very rich vein to mine when it comes to understanding uh, human performance to certain degrees, and also some of the controversies that are running around the internet about uh, what is and is not valuable training. All right. Now, I can tell you that my best performances on the casino in class 
uh, was a 1349 from open front concealment and a 1354 from closed front concealment. Now, I don't remember my exact time from the reunion. It was just a little slower than yours, but I did have one shot that I pulled out. So that was with a one second penalty. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't want to live on that difference. Right. <laughs> Let's be honest. Yeah, but uh, uh, the record is a 1033 and that is jointly held by Sheriff James Hale of Oconee County, Georgia, who happens to be my sheriff, and uh, Mr. Kirk, and we won't say Kirk's last name because he likes to stay off the internet, uh, but he, he's also in there at 1033. So you said you saw about a 15% penalty on the uh, record? Yeah, it was, it was a 15%. It was, it was an interesting example. Um, there are guys on the internet, and um, let, let's talk about them. Um, there's a, a concept from the literature that we need to stop and think about, and there's you can classify motor skills all different sorts of ways. But one of the, the main ways that motor skills are often classified is whether it's an open or a closed motor skill. A closed motor skill is, guess what it says, it's closed to environmental influences. You perform the skill kind of regardless of what's going on in the environment. So uh, an example of a closed motor skill might be the time that it takes you to draw and present the pistol to a target when all you're waiting for is, you know, an auditory beep. Uh, it's a time to complete a reload, that sort of a thing. So those are closed motor skills. They're very predictable. Um, again, you just simply run the skill. It doesn't, you know, it's out, it's immune from outside influences. Now, obviously, the other kind of uh, motor skill is open. And it's going to be uh, an open motor skill is open to environmental influences, something in the uh, environment external to you and what you're doing in your head is going to have an influence on the motor skills. And there are guys out there that will tell you that my performance on closed motor skills is all that matters and this must show my proudness. There are other guys that just very openly scoff at closed motor skill drills and say the only thing that really matters are open motor skills because that more accurately reflects reality. And I think we saw um, an interesting window into that in that by simply varying the reloads a little bit, we took what was a closed motor skill of the casino drill and we just gave it a little bit of open influence because again, the magazines were randomly loaded. You didn't know when that was going to come through. Um, you know, the thing that would have been really nasty to do with that variation, uh, and I would love to run this experiment sometime, would be in addition to changing the, the magazine reloads, uh, it would also be to introduce a dummy round into there. So somewhere in the process, you would actually have to diagnose, did my gun stop running? because I hit a dummy, I need to tap rack this thing to clear it, or is it a reload? And that would have been a really, really nasty thing to do as far as that goes. But, you know, I think that a lot of people get wrapped around the axle as far as what is best. Um, and a lot of times I'd say it's almost like a confirmation bias. Uh, the guys that are really, really good at closed motor skills, you know, whether it's the test, the game white standards, uh, just what your raw time is for a, a, a one, one shot draw from the holster, they get really obsessed about that. Um, on the other hand, the guys that are all about open motor skills kind of poo-poo that, you know, while well, you're just, you know, shooting this bullseye over and over again, that has no value either. And, you know, that's kind of my conclusion thinking about this a lot and all the research I've done is that they're, they're effectively, they're both wrong. Uh, you've got to have uh, both of those in order for it to work. Uh, you know, the other interesting part of the casino drill is that, you know, that's also, um, you're starting to see the, uh, the uh, influence of something called cognitive load which is effectively how much you're having to think about while everybody's going on. So on the, you know, the casino drill, the cognitive load is fairly low. You're trying to keep track of um, how many shots you fire. You've got to find the right target. You've got to keep track of how many rounds you fired. on. And again, the, the reloads never come at the end of a target because that would be too easy. They always come in the middle of a target. So there's definitely some cognitive load going on there. So you're starting to see um, the impact of opening a motor skill up slightly. Um, and I think that it's a really interesting window into a controversy that really isn't a controversy. It's like you're, you know, if you hold that, you know, your performance on closed motor skills is all that matters. I think you're wrong. If you poo poo closed motor skills and say, Hey, the only thing that matters is what you do in open, uh, motor skills. I think you're wrong there as well. Well, to that, I will say that I, you know, I've been watching the, the argument going back and forth. I've even participated in a little bit. I see the closed uh, no, guy. No, sir, you have stirred it up. You have, you, you have stirred it up, to be fair. Yeah. Um, I see the closed camp, as you would describe it, basically dismissing the open camp, but I don't see the open camp completely dismissing the closed camp. Uh, and to, to that effect, I want to say that, you know, Mr. Holshin has been on the show several times. 
uh, in a Facebook group brought up something about something he had deserved at a, at a match. And he was immediately accosted with, you know, how often do you shoot matches, et cetera. Well, John has Holson, as you and I both know, has shot plenty of matches. And what I want to say to the people that are completely dismissing someone like John Holston is John can go on range any weekend and shoot a match if he wants to. You can't go match his operational experience. And uh, I think maybe we hang out in different parts of the Internet. I have seen people that tend to emphasize very heavily on the tactics. Um, They tend to poo poo. Um, raw technical skill. I think part of it is that some of those guys that I'm privy to come from more of a law enforcement community where finding any base of technical shooting skill is just really, really hard to do. Um, but I've definitely seen the guys out there that simply say, hey, you know, tactics tend to, you know, if you just have good tactics, you know, if you practice these op- more of these open drills, you're going to do a lot better. That there's, you know, almost no value to sitting there and being able to shoot the test uh, to a reasonable standard. Um, or, you know, practicing the test over and over again. Yeah, I, I would assert that that my personal take in is in what we have, you know, most of the people have been on the show that I think they're, they're putting forth is that technical skill does matter. But there's a point in which, you, you know, you've got to have solid, acceptable technical skill, but then you need to start focusing on cognitive skill. Well, and that just, you know, and to a certain degree application. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to learn to apply the skills. And that's where, you know, I think the, the open guys are like, we need to learn to apply the skills. Uh, I think the counter to that is you've got to have some skills to actually apply. You know, it doesn't matter how tactical you are, what, what position of advantage you manage to maneuver yourself to. If the time comes and let's say that it's a, you have to place uh, a shot into the black with the equivalent of a black of a bullseye at 10 yards. If that's a problem you have to solve, that's a problem you have to solve. And then suddenly having shot, you know, a bunch of B8 drills suddenly becomes very relevant to the problem at hand. Right. You know, when, when Brian Easterge and I first began discussing this a couple of months ago, and when it kind of this latest round of it kind of steamed to, to fan from that flame, you know, what we were saying was, you know, if you're down second and a quarter or so on your presentation to the target, you're probably good to start focusing on any things versus chasing that just arbitrary metric of, the sub-second draw, which, you know, it was put out this weekend on the internet that if you don't have a sub-second draw that you can't speak about it, I have performed a sub-second draw. So for the record, I can't speak about it. Um, I'm going to, at some point in time here soon, arbitrarily choose a standard by which you must meet to discuss anything related to use of force. I just haven't decided which one it's going to be yet. I'm open to the floor for nominations. Well, you know, the other thing, just to, you know, um, the point about the one second draw stroke, you know, some of that, I really wonder if it's specific, you know, because again, I nerd out on this stuff. Um, I couldn't get the, the data on the fast drill, right? But when you look at some of the more demanding technical shooting standards, I would say they were Jedlinski's black belt standards and Gabe's turbo pins. Those tend to be won in a dominant fashion by people running AIWB holsters, appendix inside the waistband. When I look at Jedlinski stuff, um, only 15% of the people that have gotten have met his black belt standards did it from a strong side hip holster. Uh, I think both of those guys are running ALS holsters, which is a, is a very fast rig. And of the gay white people, only about 7% of the people that have earned a turbo pin did it from a strong side hip holster. So, you know, the, the validity of the one second draw, um, I really wonder how much of that is equipment specific. Um, I didn't hear a lot about a one second draw to appendix holsters became really popular. Um, you know, actually delivering a, a, a sub one second presentation, from a strong side hip in you know real life concealment, uh, that is rarely actually seen in the in the you know forget the real world, but in, in class or even you know in, anywhere that I'm aware of outside of a few internet flukes, uh, maybe some guys on Instagram that you know take the best twenty runs that sort of thing. All right, you know, speaking of Gabe White standards, I shot a light pin from strong side hip concealment and dropped points on one run out of all of them and everything else i put was in the a shot i'm pretty happy with the light pin on demand from from concealment strong side hip with that uh, i feel like that's a good enough level of technical skill that i can focus on other things yeah and, and to be fair i worked uh you know I, I i got a turbo pin the second time i ran through that mm-hmm. i had to put in a tremendous volume of work to get that i had to tweak my gear a little bit um, I, I tweaked holster, I quick, uh, tweaked concealment garment, and I draconianly did mega reps 
on that first shot from the holster at speed. I didn't do a lot of work. Uh, if you were to ask me to show up on the range today, could I probably pass those standards? I, I would certainly, you know, I, I'm always drawing a blank as far as what's better, light or dark. I could certainly post up a couple of turbo pin runs and whatever the next standard is fairly easily, but I would have to do a lot of, uh, you know, give me a week, week or two to do a lot of work to get back to that turbo pin standard. That's part of the problem with some of that extreme performance is it can be very hard to maintain over the long run. Uh, you know, you're talking dry practice, you know, every day to, to maintain that. Right. It's dark, light, turbo in order of succession. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the first 10 years of my career, I carried in a Safari Land 070 holster, which is a triple retention holster. And for those that are unaware, it has a thumb snap. It has a snap that you must hit with the uh, with the bird finger of your strong hand. And you must do a rearward motion rock of the pistol because the ejection port locks into the holster to successfully complete that draw. I, when I was running from the, with that holster, I got where I could regularly uh, do 125 draws out of it. And I've got a documented 114 on record in a class. I was regularly practicing with that holster and working towards speed to get out of the holster. Now, if I tried to go out there and work that with that holster, as you say, it would take me probably a week or two to get back even anywhere approaching the one and a quarter from it. And, and you know, the question then becomes points of diminishing return. You know, if you were to take that exact same um, time, uh, you know, because basically it's a resource investment, whether it's time, energy, money, uh, are there better places we could be spending it? You know, would that time be better spent at a uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu gym, getting better at rolling? Would it be better at just increasing your aerobic conditioning, increasing your strength? You know, there, there, you know, there's a point of diminishing return, and that's always an interesting discussion to hear what that is for people. Um, I would say to, to um, as part of what's being right though is that you have to understand how the human mind works. So I think one of the advantages of closed motor skills though is it favors the development of this thing called automaticity. So if I can riff here for a second, your brain actually has distinct components um, that are often redundant. And one of those systems is your memory system. Uh, you have an explicit memory system and an implicit memory system. Um, explicit memory is stuff that you intentionally put in there. If you have a, a test in school and you have to memorize the states and their capitals and you manage to cram the night in before you take the test and you know, four weeks from now, you won't be able to remember most of those states and capitals because that, stored, that was stored in explicit memory. And it tends to be much more of a short-term affair. Implicit memory is a distinct memory system. And a subsystem of that is this thing called procedural memory. And procedural memory is how we do things, you know, to use an example that everybody can probably associate with is tying your shoes. You know, if you ever taught a child to tie your shoes, that's quite the, the undertaking. But eventually, most of us put absolutely zero thought into tying our shoes. You know, the other really common example of that is driving a car. Um, but the ugly truth is, is that when we talk about people performing these skills under stress, um, there's always going to be freaks who can access things that aren't in procedural memory under high levels of stress. That's probably has a genetic component. They've also probably trained to do that. You know, you think about a, uh, a very high level performing ER doc. He not only has to have certain physical skills, he has to access certain, you know, uh, medical data on the fly as far as that goes um, under a certain amount of duress. Now, admittedly, it's not his life and death that he's dealing with, but that, that pressure is definitely there. Um, the, the ugly, you know, the ugly truth is though, is unless something is in procedural memory, uh, the odds of it go down dramatically as far as actually seeing it when, when life and death is on the line. And that's where I think to a certain degree, that's where closed motor skills really, really do matter, right? Um, that what you're going to see from practicing closed motor skills a lot is something we call automaticity. Uh, you know, an example, you know, automaticity is quickly, uh, commonly defined as, you know, one step from stimulus to retrieval. So on a very high level shooter, when the gun unexpectedly run empties, they don't sit there and stare at the gun and go, oh my, why did it do that? You know, they're, um, while they're, you know, coming to the conscious realization that the guns run empty, they're already reaching for the replacement magazine. The magazine's coming up. Um, that's a very, very smooth reload. That's a, you know, it's not taking almost any of their mental resources to be able to do that. Um, and, you know, uh, despite that, the, despite the fact that both, you know, the, the number one shooter and myself, um, have a very high level of automaticity with our reloads, just simply not knowing when they were coming was enough to um, um, affect our performance. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. You and I, we when we did our previous episode, one of the solo ones with you, and I got to play one of my favorite videos. Um, you know, you and I did the Spalding class last year before the world ended, and we were introduced to his inboard manipulation technique uh, with, with the pistol. And I have since I can consciously tell myself I'm going to do inboard and I'm going to hit the slide stop with my support hand thumb on the reload. Well, the other day I was at the range and I just took the opportunity to shoot the Bakersfield qual and I went to do the reload and I was so concentrating on all the other tasks that as I seated the magazine home, I hit with strong hand thumb and I laughed at myself as I extended the pistol to the target to shoot because what has been built into my subconscious is that repetitive motion where I built it to the level of automaticity of sending the slide home on an emergency reload with my strong hand thumb. I have to be in my conscious mind to hit it with a support hand thumb. Yeah. And if you were in a life and death struggle, I can just about guarantee which one of those two motor programs are going to default to. The sh strong hand thumb. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cause it, it's, years and years and years of doing it that way and coming over the top and even though i consciously know i am through my testing that i actually perform better with the inboard manipulations i still default when i'm not consciously thinking about it to the overhand method and strong hand thumb etc for operating the gun yep and that's, uh, you know, those repetitions are really the key because that's how stuff gets into procedural memory. We have to accept the fact that nothing is going to get into procedural memory by accident. It's going to be something like tying your shoes, something that you do twice a day, pretty much your entire time since adolescence and on. And that's where some of the closed motor skills become important uh, because you are getting the volume of repetitions that you need. Now, I would point out because a lot of guys just hear me say, hey, uh, effectively are hearing me say, just do the rep, do the rep, do the reps. But one of the things I found digging around is that you also have to trigger your mind that the reps you're doing are important. And the key, the mental signal for that is focus. So I'm, I'm guilty of this. There was a time when I was going to do my drive work. Um, I would turn on some music that I would kind of jam out to while I was getting my repetitions. Uh, that's probably counterproductive. Uh, the noise and distraction are kind of the signal to bring it. This is important. When you do one thing with quiet dedication and focus, that's one of those triggers to the mind that this is really important. So when you combine that deliberate intentional focus with lots of repetition, that's how you get stuff into procedural memory. And again, I really think it's a point that we need both. Um, one of the things you've, I think we've talked about in the past is that the brain hates novel stimuli, right? It hates being seeing things it hasn't seen before because they can't put them in context and by default, they assume they're bad, right? And that's where open skills can be really good because the open skills are going to much more resemble the environment you're actually going to need to do them. So performing open motor skills is going to help eliminate the matter of novelty, and it will teach us the context in which those motor skills are going to need to be applied. But again, the closed motor skills are necessary because it is going to take thousands of repetitions to get this stuff shifted into procedural memory. Guys, if it's not in procedural memory, there's absolutely no guarantee um, that you'll be able to produce it under stress. Um, and I would point out that even, even procedural memory, being in that implicit memory system isn't a guarantee because even that implicit memory system can be attacked by fatigue. If you are completely exhausted, um, even that implicit memory system can break down, which is why you know, we talk about kind of a holistic approach to this, you know, getting lots of sleep, exercise and stuff like that, that even stuff in procedural memory, if we get you exhausted enough, that's why you see some of the military selections, you know, I think ranger school is really bad about that, about just completely running you into dirt, uh, into the dirt without rest. It really does see what's been put away in procedural memory. All right. You have mentioned uh, in several other conversations uh, Hackathorn's model of what is it? Incompetent, competent, good, and great. Would you explain that? Yeah. So, um, uh, Hackathorn, um, one of the greats in the firearms training business and stuff like that. When I was taking his class, and this is actually the the chart that you mentioned in class presentations, I actually originally came from trying to more quantify his standards, right? But Hackathorn said there were four people, four kinds of uh, shooters in the world. You had the incompetent, the competent, the good, and the great. And if you think about it, a big chunk of the population is utterly incompetent. They just don't know what they're doing with guns. They're dangerous because they're shooting a lot. They have no skill. Uh, then you have competent shooters. An example of a competent shooter would be a law enforcement officer that can reliably pass a qualification. They can 
they're confident with the gun, they're safe with the gun, they can load, unload, reload, clear, simple malfunction, that kind of stuff, but they're certainly not good with the gun, right? Then you've got good and great. And Hackathorn's point was, you don't have to be a great shooter to dominate a fight, but you do have to be a good shooter, right? Um, you know, there's probably, you know, again, the, the point of diminishing returns. We need to get to good. Great is just kind of uh, gravy at this point. And, you know, we, we debated some about what those standards are, but if we look, you know, the, the guy that came up with this hackathon, you know, he has his uh, headshot standards, which are basically the heads on either IDP or USPSA targets. And it's the, the targets, there's three targets at five yards and there's a three second par. And the idea is you shoot all three left to right, then right to left, then start in the middle and pick up the other two as you go. And, you know, if you can get all nine hits on there, he considered that that good enough. And I think that's another interesting point to the guys that, you know, um, tend to focus on, you know, a one second draw stroke. There are people out there who have a lot of experience in the real world. Uh, I'm not trying to uh, draw on his name, but I think of Paul Howe. I've been through Paul's uh, pistol and rifle instructor. Paul Howe's standard for a presentation from the holster to what is effectively a USPSA zone is 1.7 seconds. Now, there's a lot of guys in the, the, the training world that would laugh at that as a mediocre standard and, and not worthy. But Paul Howe said that. Now, the other thing I would point out is that Paul expects that standard irregardless. Uh, if you've been up for 48 hours, if you've hiked uh, 20 miles, if you're wearing a gas mask, if you're wearing gloves, guess what the standard still is? It's still 1.7 seconds. Now, I would say that, you know, you probably, you know, if, if that's your goal is to meet, you know, that sounds a lot like if I can produce, you know, 1.5 uh, without a lot of, uh, you know, without gas mask or gloves or anything like that, I can reliably meet the 1.7 when things go. So again, you know, when you look at people that have actually been there or done that and trained people for the world, you just don't see that obsession with the, with the one second draw to hit, you know, uh, the way I think about a one second draw to hit is uh, it's a, it's a tactic, right? And the tactic is just simply a way of accomplishing thing. If you have a one second draw, that is a tactic that you have in your back pocket. And when it's, execute it well it's a very effective you know um i hate to say anything good about spencer but uh you know one of the classes that was great for both open and closed uh motor skills was the edp class that tom givens craig douglas and uh our late friend william maple ran and that combined classroom work range work as well as force on four scenarios and uh i was watching spencer run through one of the drills and when it came time to actually shoot the bad guy in the simulated convenience store robbery right um it, it took place at a speed that was imperceptible to the human eye what it looked like was that uh spencer shrugged his shoulders and the dude was shot it was effectively a magic trick because it took place at a speed faster than you could really process it i would offer that you know if you were to add 0.2 onto that right that's still the blink of a human eye if you can get the gun out in 1.2 that's still effectively a magic trick and there's a lot of work and probably arguably equipment that's going to make the difference between a 1.2 and a one when it comes to this sort of issue. Okay. Uh, I had a phone conversation with Gary G earlier today and, you know, he made the point that a lot of the, the places in which he operated, you know, you got caught with a gun. It was a bad deal. And so the gun was carried extremely discreetly, which made it kind of difficult to get to. And so a lot of the times that draw that he had to make had to be done in a very discreet manner. And that's just not going to be something that's going to be there on the clock. You know, and Spencer talks about one of the things he learned from the EDP class is that there's two draws. There's just the flat out racing for speed. And then there is a discrete draw. And yeah. you know, that's where the whole open and close thing comes is if you're not processing and being able to ascertain which one to do and to accomplish the other, you know, that, I think that's the argument that, like John Holshen has been trying to make and I've been trying to make and several other people. Uh, yield the floor to you. Oh, I, I think we're in agreement there. I just think that there's guys that because it's what they do best, it's what they tend to think it's important. Um, you know, as far as like, you know, what should you be working for as the guy? You know, I think that, uh, uh, you know, the, the basic level of confidence for me to get you that confident is a 21 second casino. Um, I've been surprised, like when I run in my LE classes and stuff like that, um, you know, what a lot of people would kind of scoff at like a 21 second casino, they just flat out can't do it. Right. So I think a 21 second casino is certainly going to put you into that confident category. Um, while I've seen it done much faster, 18 seconds on a casino 
especially if you've got a randomized reload in there, that's that's pretty good. You know, anything under you know, depending on the, the variation of the casino you're running, you know, the, you know, the, the, the 10 seconds are just absolutely amazing. But I think those are based on shooting it solely as a closed motor skill. And that's one of the things I do love about the casino is it's a very ripe environment for messing with people, for lack of better words. You know, uh, you can run it backwards. You can shoot odd numbers first. Uh, there's all kinds of variations that you can do that if you want to play around with open versus closed and shooting under a cognitive load, it's a very, very rich vein from which to mine I, I you know tom was a genius when he came up with that i just don't think that he even he is fully cognizant of how great that drill is uh you know my, my, my most evil version of that that i've come up with so far is actually have two six-sided dice and uh one i just went to label maker and there's three labels that say up and three levels that say down so you roll the dice hit the start on the shot timer and you lift your hand up so if it says you know three up you start at the number three go four five six one two and you know if it says down Five, you start at the five and work your way down. And that will really test whether somebody has that automatic handling of the pistol. Because all of a sudden, the main task you're charged with is actually, you know, shooting the right targets in the right order. Uh, and that takes a lot of all of your mental energy. And if you have to sit there and think about running the gun, it's not going to work out well with you. Yeah, our, our friend Doug Jones has a version of it that he runs that uh, he uses seven IDPA targets. And they're numbered one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you'll have maybe say like all the all the odd targets are to your left, all the even are to your right. And you know, you're standing looking up range, and there's like a cover in between that you're having to, to switch sides on. And just before the buzzer goes off, you have to look back over one of your shoulders and they're holding up a card that is which number you start with. And so it may be number four. And so when the buzzer goes, you got to draw, hit four or four times, come over here, hit five, five times, go back over here, hit six, six times, go back over here, hit seven, seven times, keeping up your reloads. And then, you know, once you get past seven, you got to come back up through one, two, and three, and you got to keep all of that straight. And it's not yeah. easy at all. Yeah, It's really and, easy uh, to, to befuddle that up. And, uh, you know, another great variation you could do on that, that, uh, and again, this context may not matter as much in the civilian world, but like the law enforcement is put some of those targets high and some of those targets low. So when you're engaging a high target, you get to be standing. Uh, if the target is low, you've got to transition to a kneeling or some, you know, some kind of a low cover position. So that's much more of an open drill where you're having to, you know, the, the low target is going to conforce you to, uh, to the low, uh, move you to the low position. There, there's a huge amount of value there uh, for not a whole lot of resource investment. Well, you know, one benefit to closed drills is that they're easy to practice. So Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would say that's where dry practice, you don't have any excuses. I mean, um, I would strongly encourage people to develop their motor skills and especially the manipulation side of the house. Um, you can learn to suit a, a certain amount of marksmanship dry, but I think that high levels of marksmanship do actually require dealing with the blast of the gun going off stuff you're going to be dealing with. But anything that doesn't involve the gun going off can be done dry. And those reps don't cost anything. It's just a matter of the time. Again, depending on where you are in your development, uh, if you're starting out in this, just take 10 minutes. If you're doing this a little bit longer, you can get longer practice sessions in there, but simply do all this work dry. And again, you're going to be much better off. You know, if you've got, if you want to dry practice for an hour a week, don't spend it in one hour block, you know, break that up into, you know, five, 12 minute blocks or four 15 minute blocks, spread that out throughout the week. But, you know, anything that doesn't involve getting the, um, the gun actually firing can be done dry and you don't need that much to do it. Um, I've got a, um, hoping to come up with a presentation a little bit later this year about dry practice, but realistically to get into dry practice, I, I think you need three spare magazines for your gun. So you're not having to, to shuck ammo back and forth and a couple of the Rogers tap rack trainers, uh, if you've got that and uh, maybe a simple PowerPoint for target presentation that I'm going to be putting out for free here shortly, dude, you're going to be able to get all the closed motor skills you need. You then do some range work to validate it. And then you have to go out and look for places to um, get your open motor skills developed. And those are going to be, I mean, in all fairness, those are going to be harder to find. But there's, a, you know, there's more and more venues out there. If you want a, a great example of an open drill, think of a Craig Douglas class, right? When you're actually physically fighting another person for control of your gun, their gun, I don't know, our gun, maybe knives, everything. That's a great example of a, an open motor skill. Um, 
you know, so there's uh, other places you get to think with the gun, you know, some of the CQB classes, whether it's Will Petty's vehicle CQB class, that's a very, that's a great class for making you think. There's various shoot house classes that make you think with the gun in your hands. Uh, the other one that I think we tend to dismiss because it can be done very gamey, uh, but it can be done very cheaply is just video simulators. Um, uh, Bill at his place out in Oklahoma at the Great Meat Hall range actually has a video simulator. But at any time you go to a major metropolitan area and you look around at the ranges, at least one of them is going to have a high quality video simulator that can get you there. And again, you're not going to have necessarily have the gun going off. Although there are simulators that use live weapons, um, but that's a great way to get rid of the novelty of dealing with violence. And it's going to be very low overhead. You can run a lot of reps in a fairly short uh, period of time to get the repetitions that you need in the open motor skills as well, because that's that's one of the drawbacks to open motor skills is they're just harder to get your hands on. Oh, well, I've heard about this class by some guy named John Hearn called Cognitive Pistol. So what what is Cognitive Pistol? Uh, well, first off, I'm not the, the first person to use that term. Uh, as far as I know, Dave Spalding has had in the past a class called Cognitive Pistol. Uh, John Johnston and his great crew over at Citizens Defense Research have a, very, have a, a class with a similar title. Uh, the point of my class is to teach you to think and, with the gun in your hand. And a lot of that involves one of the, the cognitive loads I'll put in there is a, an, a topic we don't address very much, which is the tactical anatomy. Basically, how do I shoot people in the way that's most likely to guarantee that they're going to stop doing what they're doing in as short a time as possible? So I use a combination of things such as uh, a number of LEDs. Um, I'm always coming up with more devious ways to do it. The, the last iteration of the class I ran, there was a, uh, a set of LEDs that told you what to deliver as far as whether it was, you know, one to the head or two to the body or three to the body. But then there was another uh, box of LEDs that um, represented the actual threat and you could only go on a certain color. And I would sit there and I would flash the other colors. And it was interesting because uh, people would twitch and do stuff like that. And that, that very much simulates maybe an armed robbery where somebody's pointing a gun at you and you're waiting for your mm -hmm. opportunity. So sitting there and being able to kind of remain calm and just wait your turn for that go signal can be important. And that's, you know, that's part of what cognitive pistol is. Uh, I don't have a version in 2021, but I'm hoping to roll out a two day version of that. I wasn't sure if I had enough material for a full two day class, but uh, after having taught it around the country so far this year, there's definitely a, a need for a two day version of that. And uh, I'll be pushing that out as well. I don't have any, uh, the only date I think I have for that set is uh, November at the meat hall range, uh, but November, 2022 is over a year away. Um, I'll, I'll be booking some classes, hopefully a little bit sooner for the two-day version of that coming up. Yeah, where can people find your class schedule? So um, right now, uh, Facebook is the best place. Uh, I have a, a temporary placeholder website, which is jhern.com. Uh, if I can, with a little bit of time, the Two Pillars Training, that's the name of my company, Two Pillars Training, uh, that, you, uh, that website will be up soon and running. Uh, but for right now, Facebook and Instagram is where I am. You can get uh, class information, schedules, that sort of thing there. And uh, hopefully we'll have the, the full website up shortly. Okay. Um, what about open and close stuff that I failed to ask you that you would like to address? Um, I think that the thing I can't emphasize enough is that they're both important. Anybody that tells you that this singular thing is not important I think is missing the point. And I think that if you understand some of the, the brain science-y stuff of this kind of stuff, it makes a lot more sense. So I would just encourage, you know, everybody do your reps in dry practice to build the closed motor skills you're going to need, then find venues for, you know, to practice your open motor skills uh, to see how well you've learned that stuff. And that can just simply be a match, you know, that there's, you know, matches are potentially an open, uh, an opportunity to test open motor skills. Now, you know, that's a difference. One of the arguable differences between IDPA and USBSA matches, IDPA tends to, to script it a lot more, move from this point to this point to this point. You know, in a USPSA match, you're free to shoot it whichever is the fastest way you want to. But again, just something as subtle as going to a match is going to have some value when it uh, starts to, you know, talking about learning these skills in context. Okay. I'm being besieged by a beagle all of a sudden. So excuse me if I get distracted. Uh, she has escaped her uh, her confinement and has come and found me. So it may get loud in the background here in just a minute, people. Uh, right now, she's straddling between two laundry baskets and, and is about to get loud, I think. Um, <laughs> sorry for the distraction. She's supposed to be captive right now. Um, you're going to be at TACCON? Uh, I'll be at TACCON in 2022. 
Um, like I said, I've already booked, um, I'm pretty much limited to one class a month and I'm pretty much booked all the way through 2022 now. I'm trying to finalize some dates. I'm going to be at Carl Wins in January, uh, doing something with Randy Harris in February, TechCon March. So my, my, my dance card is filling up pretty fast. And like I said, the, uh, um, go to the website, uh, give me a little bit of time and we'll have full information up there. All right, cool. Um, folks, as far as future episodes that are, that are be rolling out, uh, tomorrow, I will be recording an episode with Mr. Kevin Davis, and that will air a week after this episode debuts. And Mr. Davis has written an excellent book on uh, use of force investigations. And so that episode will delve deeply in, into that topic. Uh, Mr. Bruce Cartwright has agreed to come on. Bruce is a retired FBI agent. And uh, he and I will be doing an episode on uh, the history of the FBI firearms training and their weapon selection over the years tom givens will be doing an episode when he gets home from a uh, current herculean road trip that he is on and we're going to basically cover uh jay and now the terrier has decided to check in uh he is going to cover the the era from like uh j henry fitzgerald up through the leather leather slap matches that uh, cooper and his guys did so we're, we're, we're trying to roll in as much of the historical perspective as possible. Um, we do have several new uh, people who have decided to sponsor the show. If you're listening to this in podcast form, there is a link in the show notes that you can click on and you can become a monthly sponsor of the show. We're up to like four. Uh, Kill Kadir is the, is the newest uh, sponsor in that. So thanks to Kill. Uh, Mr. Bill, I know we can't say his last name, uh, Zach and Keith are the other two. So if you'd like to join that list, uh, it'd be much appreciated. And uh, we're still hitting about that 200 to 225 average uh, on uh, the new episodes rolling out. Uh, the, the actual 30-day episode numbers are getting up above 250, uh, but that a lot is being driven by one episode that did really, really, really well. Uh, so if you're enjoying the show, please, as we've said numerous times, share the links with your intelligent friends, but don't share it with the dumb ones. And uh, we would like for this to keep going. Uh, the feedback that we're getting is um, uh, very much appreciated. Like I said, I had a call from Gary G today to talk about an episode just before John and I started recording this one. I got a very nice email uh, about the shows. Uh, last night, I got a really fun email that someone who had listened to the episode with Shane Gosa got on eBay and found a copy of Greg Morrison's book, and someone had written a transcription on the first page, and he sent me a picture of that, and I sent it to Shane, and that transcription may very well have been written by Jeff Cooper himself. We're actually going to get some writing samples from Mr. Cooper and try to verify those. So those are the fun things that, that is great to hear. Uh, John, you have anything you'd like to say in closing? No, I was going to say uh, you were mentioning history. Uh, for those that don't know, we just lost Elton Carl a couple weeks, uh, just a little over a week ago. Um, it was my great honor and privilege to sit down with Elton for about two and a half hours when I was visiting California. Absolutely fascinating man, lived life to the fullest. Uh, really sorry to hear about his passing. Uh, really a guy that lived it to the fullest and, and was there, you know, from the beginning. Um, I'll try to put you in touch with somebody that spent a lot of time with Eldon and maybe you can get hooked up. I think that uh, Eldon's Carl, uh, Eldon's story is something that uh, is certainly worth a show. Yeah, you know, Akil Kadir sent me a message this week and he said, because we, we talked about Eldon in last week's episode and um, Akil sent me a message this week said, hey, I'm looking at pictures on Eldon's webpage and it looks like he's shooting kind of like an isosceles stance. I'm like, well, yeah. He said, but didn't, you know, didn't uh, Latham and Eno's kind of come up with that. I said, well, you got to remember this is pre-internet time and it's possible that multiple people were developing techniques in different parts of the country and they just didn't know that each other were doing that. And so, you know, now on the internet, everybody can immediately show whatever they're done to everybody. Well, back in the days, it was all letter correspondence or seeing people in person. And so it's- Or magazine right. articles. Or yeah. Yeah, magazine articles. Um, one of the things Gary G mentioned, you know, was Camp Perry used to have, you know, five to 7,000 people would show up to those matches. And now, like last year, it was like a little over 100. And But all the information exchange that used to would take place in person then. So it's, it's not beyond the scope of possibility that different people 
like I say, in different parts of the country, were developing the same techniques because there's at least two people credited with inventing the radio. Well, and, and you know, two people invented calculus. Newton just gets credit for it first, but it was uh, calculus was co-discovered, for lack of better words. That happens all the time. Uh, you know, just do, at the risk of bunny trailing here, I think that what we think of quote unquote as a Weaver stance was the public's distortion of it was really warped when law enforcement adopted it uh, without understanding what it was. Um, I have seen some horrible straw man argument kind of Weaver stances that don't resemble what any of those people we think of is that would know it, whether we're talking Jack Weaver, Alvin Carl, Jeff Cooper, uh, Phil Reed, uh, Chapman. I'm drawing one, uh, a blank on one of the other original co uh, combat measure, but that's not what they actually did. And I, I hate it when people um, are so weak in their arguments that they have to straw man other people's stuff. Um, Gary G pointed out to me in our phone call today that yes, Weaver did win one of the leather slap matches using the Weaver technique. He then lost the next five. <laughs> yeah. So there's some perspective for you too there. And he got that information from Mr. Eldon Carl. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure what happened though was that people started adopting his technique and it worked better. They probably out, you know, right. we think of that as out weavering weaver, you know. Right. Well, you know, from what the, the information he was giving me is that there was still guys that were doing the old the the, the previous techniques, which Gary pointed out that uh, in the FBI training facilities into the 90s they still had their mirrors up for people practicing the fbi crouch oh yeah and that was one of the things that uh, i took from my conversation with eldon is that he still thought that technique had a lot of value at extremely close ranges mm -hmm. um i would love to have seen what eldon thought of craig douglas's material but uh you know especially for somebody that you know with the kinesthetic gifts that you know people like eldon had uh, you know, that, that that previous FBI classic point shooting technique, you know, he still thought that was what you did when, you, you know, when you were an arm length away. Uh, that was something I took from his conversation was that you could just do it so fast. And by that, I think he meant he could do it so fast. Right. Yeah. That's one of the things that sometimes just gifted prodigies and not saying that they don't put work in. Uh, but some of the people like super physical gifts that allows them to develop skill even beyond hard work is Sometimes they just don't have the reality that other people can't get to that. Yeah, well, there, uh, again, if you want an interesting book, uh, The Sports Gene, I'm drawing a blank on the author, but you know, he talks about how any, any of the elite performers, whether it's a major league baseball player, um, an Olympic athlete, they have certain giftings, everything from the ratio of fast twitch to slow twitch muscle they have. Um, you know, uh, obviously, sprinters need more fast twitch, marathoners need more slow twitch. Um, the ability to transport oxygen and just work ethic, whether you find practice fun or not, has a genetic component. So a lot of the guys at that very elite level of performance, um, they, they ain't like us. Right. Yeah. I could have gone out and put in hours a day in baseball practice. And I still never would have made it to the to even the minor leagues, much less the major yeah, leagues. Unless your vision is like 2005, you're not making it to major league baseball. They're just sorry. There's a vision screen out for that. Um, I think a lot of us are familiar with the, the concept of Moneyball, where you started looking at player statistics. One of the other interesting examples of that is there was a guy who was recruiting baseball players based solely on their vision standards. He said, that if you just tell me what their vision standards are, those are the players you want to pick. And those players did remarkably well, because that's what baseball, that particular sport requires, is effectively superhuman vision. Yeah. Right. Sorry, we nerded out here. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we do. Uh -huh. Yeah, you more so than some others, but that is what we do. Uh, anything else in closing? No, I appreciate your time and uh, you, you uh, allowing me to, to scream from the, the, the halls of the Internet, the walls of the Internet, that everybody's wrong about everything. That's a message that needs to get out there. That, that is true. And that is probably the one thing that we can get everybody on the Internet to agree with, as long as they all have the caveat that it doesn't apply to them. Except me. <laughs> yeah, everybody but me is wrong about everything. All right, well, folks, this will be a little bit shorter episode than some of the, the recent ones, but I think we accomplished what we intended to, to do with this one. So, uh, everyone, thank you for your time. <laughs>